throughout throughout the letter of Hebrews God has called the readers of this letter to remain true to Jesus to keep their faith in Jesus we believe they were being threatened with excommunication from the temple or the synagogues or both so these are Jews in two places that they have gone all of their lives they would no longer be welcomed in. And what they had to do in order to remain in those places, uh, have, have uh, permission to enter those places, would be to reject Jesus and their faith in, Christian, in, in Jesus, Christianity. Now that's not stated specifically in those terms in this letter but from the clues in the letter, that's what we believe was taking place. So think about this. They were tempted to go back to something older than the gospel, something older than the good news of Jesus. In today's passage in Hebrews, he's warning them about going to something newer than the gospel, newer than the good news of Jesus. And we're going to look at that in just a moment, but first we have a pop quiz. First we have a pop quiz. Uh, so for those who will be watching this on video on the internet, you want to pause the video at this point and go grab a piece of paper and something to write with. You want to number one through nine, and you only need a short space, a little bit of room for one through eight. You'll need a longer space for number nine. You who are here in your bulletin, you have the usual sermon insert, and it's already set up for you. And so you need something to write with. And uh, I'm going to give you a word. Uh, the first few questions, I'm going to give you a word, and you're going to write an, a one, two, three, or four English word meaning for that word. These are all words that appear in our Bibles that are not usually translated, don't look at me like that, <laughs> that are not usually translated, and you may not know what they mean. You may not know what they mean. So, the first word is Christ, Messiah. What does that mean in English? And the answer is not Jesus. <laughs> so write that down. Now, I'm only going to give you a little bit of time. I don't know if you're looking on your phones. Okay, look, look this up really quick. The second word is baptize. What does baptize mean in English? If you translate it, uh, you might say, why well, is that an English word? No, it's the Greek word given an English pronunciation. And there are many words like that in our Bibles. And so it's, we've kind of Anglicized it, Anglicized it. Uh, the technical word is we've transliterated it into English. But if we translate it, it has a specific meaning. The third word is deacon. Deacon. What does the word deacon mean if you translate it? The fourth word is disciple. Disciple. The fifth word, number five, is apostle. Apostle. In English, what is an apostle? The sixth word is hallelujah. Hallelujah. That will require more than just one word for sure. Number seven is a longer question, but still can be answered with one word. In the Old Testament, what does the word LORD in all caps represent? The word LORD in all caps represent. This appears in your English Bible 6,800 times in the Old Testament. Number eight is a longer question, but can be answered yes or no. Are the chapter and verse numbers original? To the Bible. Are the chapter and verse numbers original to the Bible? Does anybody need those? Any of those repeated? I give you enough time. 
And the final question, which will take a little bit longer, if you died today and you're standing before God and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And I'll give you more time. All right, and here are the answers. The words Christ and Messiah mean anointed. Anointed. Messiah is Hebrew, and Christ is Greek, and they both mean anointed. In the Old Testament, priests, kings, and prophets were anointed. And what that meant is someone would take some oil and pour it on their head. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of oil, sometimes there's a whole flask of oil, and it's just kind of dripped down, and we think, oh, that's kind of gross, kind of messy, and it was, but not in their culture. Um, it intended to show God's selection of that person for one of those special roles. The priests were anointed, the kings were anointed, and the prophets were anointed. And of course, Jesus, as the Prophet, priest, and king all together is the most anointed or the special anointed. But that's what Christ and Messiah means, are anointed. Number two, the word baptize means immerse. It means immerse. And I will accept dunk, I will accept dip, I will accept plunge. Uh, the word appears elsewhere in the New Testament and is used in those ways. Uh, when it's talking about Someone, a person being baptized in water, our English Bibles usually uses the transliterated word baptize from the Greek baptizmo, but in other places it is actually translated. Number three, the word deacon means servant. It means servant. Number four, the word disciple means student. Uh, that's the way it's usually translated, but I would prefer that you get, think of it as apprentice. Because when we think of a student, we have children who go to grade school and they have a teacher, uh, maybe several if you count uh, some of the teachers trade off subjects and then you've got art and, and PE and music. And then you get middle school and high school, you have a number of different teachers and, uh, and you're supposed to learn what the teachers teach, but there's no expectation, expectation that you're going to become like your teacher. But in, in the biblical culture, you only had one teacher, those who were fortunate to have a teacher at all, because there was no regular school. And the idea was that you were going to take in and adopt for yourself the teaching of your teacher, the philosophy of your teacher, and become like your teacher. And so a better word for us to use today would be apprentice. Number five, the word apostle is a sent person or one who is sent or even messenger. What's that messenger emissary. for those? Huh? Emissary. An emissary. That'll work. That'll work. Uh, it could be just for one specific task. It could have been for uh, a lifetime of tasks. Uh, we tend to think of it only as a word designated in the ones that Jesus appointed as apostles, but it was a regular word that other people used in other contexts. Number six, hallelujah means praise Yah. Praise Yah, literally, Yah being a shortened form of God's personal name, which is Yahweh. 
a shortened form of God's personal name, which is Yahweh. Now, it would take me 10 minutes to explain to you at least why it appears as Lord in all caps in our Bibles instead of putting Yahweh, and I don't have time to do that today. Uh, uh, ask me some other time, and I'll be glad to tell you. Number eight, are the chapter and verse numbers original to the Bible? The answer is no. I'm sorry, did I miss one? You kind of skipped seven. Oh, numbers in the Old Testament. Well, oh, I'm sorry, yes. In the Old Testament, what does the word Lord in all caps represent? It represents Yahweh, God's personal name. And that would take me 10 minutes to explain to you, and I don't have time to do that. Number eight, are the chapter and verse numbers original to the Bible? The answer is no. The first Bibles did not have chapter and verse numbers. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. But I want to go on to number nine. If you die today, stand before God, and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I hope you would say two things. I hope that you would say that Jesus died for my sins on the cross, something along those lines, that you believe in that, that you're trusting in his death uh, as the full payment for your sins. And then you would also include something along the lines of repentance. I have repented of my sins and I have given my life to, to Jesus as my Lord. I have consistently preached that you must receive Jesus as both your Savior and your Lord in order to be saved. I think there are lots of people who have missed the second part of that, who believe that Jesus died for sins on the cross, but they have not lived for him. They have not given their lives to him. They have not repented of their sins. And I don't believe we will see them in heaven. Now, how many of you got all nine correct? Okay. Eight? Seven? Six? I'm hoping that all of you got number nine, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, if, if many of you did, if I got half of them, I might have to not retire and stick around for a while. There's an old joke about a pastor who came to a new church and he preached a sermon and everything was fine. And the next week he preached the same sermon. And he got a lot of puzzle books, but everything was fine. The third week he preached the same sermon. And finally the deacons came up to him afterwards and said, Pastor, you preached the same sermon three weeks in a row. Is there a problem? He says, once you get that right, we'll go on to number two. <laughs> These are things that a well-studied student of the Bible would know. For example, you can't know what the role of deacons should be if you don't know that the word means serve. You can't know the mode of baptism if you don't know that the word means immerse. And knowing the truth about your English Bibles will help you understand the text. It's important to know that the chapter numbers the verse numbers and the section headings are not original to your Bibles. The chapters were invented by some guy in 1205 AD. That's a long time after the Bible was first put together. 1205, and the verse numbers weren't invented for another two or three hundred years after that by several individuals. The first English Bible, using the chapter numbers and verse numbers that we have in our Bibles, uh, didn't come out until 1600-something. And why is it important to know that? Because the chapter and verse numbers, the headings and paragraphs, can be misleading when trying to understand the text. For example, chapters. Romans 8, 1 starts with the word, therefore. Yeah. The word, therefore. And therefore is not introducing a new subject. It's drawing a conclusion about the subject that he has just talked about in chapter 7. But modern Americans think, oh, new chapter, new subject. And that's misleading. So Romans 1.8 is not a new subject. It's continuing the response to the previous subject. 
verse numbers. You can't rely on verse numbers because they're so inconsistent. One verse might have one sentence and another verse might stretch across several sentences. And sometimes a sentence has multiple verse numbers. The numbers were put in the Bible for finding your way around, not for organizing the teachings. So the verse numbers and the chapter numbers can be misleading. Another feature that appears in many Bibles today are section headings. It's just a little title of what's coming up in that section. And that can be misleading because sometimes there's more than one subject in that passage, but only one subject mentioned in the heading. And English Bibles like things in paragraphs. They like to put things in paragraphs. And the original authors didn't always put things in paragraphs. My, Bible, my Sunday school class is studying the Gospel of Luke currently, and we're looking right now at the teachings of Jesus. And just in today's passage, we saw uh, a paragraph that I think was supposed to be two paragraphs because verse one was one subject and verses two and three were a different subject. And in our study of Hebrews, we've seen the same thing. For the last two weeks, we've been in chapter 13 of Hebrews, and we're looking at short commands, almost like a list of short commands, but it doesn't present them that way. In the New International Version, the version that I'm using, it puts together three of those short commands in the first paragraph, and then it puts two commands together in the second paragraph. And I think it should be five separate paragraphs, even though they're only a sentence long, because it's five different subjects. But when we look at a paragraph, we're looking for something to, to a common subject, a common theme for all of the things in that paragraph. That's what a paragraph is supposed to be, right? So that can be misleading. These are things that you should know about your English Bibles. Uh, you should know the answers to the quiz, and there are more other things, more important things, really, that you should know. Uh, and I've given you a list of them. They're not going to appear on the screen, but they're on your sermon insert. Uh, things you should know from the Old Testament. You should know the story of Israel from Genesis to Jesus. You should know the major subjects of the Mosaic Law. Certainly not to memorize the 613 commands, but what, what groups of subjects do, does the law cover? What kinds of things does the law cover? Uh, you should know the subjects of the prophets preaching. You should know a timeline of key Old Testament events and people. Now, why should you know these things? Because you can't fully understand what we know, have in the New Testament without knowing these things of the Old Testament. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of quotes and allusions to the Old Testament in the New Testament. And you can't forget what he's talking about in the New Testament if you don't know what he's talking about in the Old Testament. We have certainly seen that true in Hebrews. We've gone back over and over and over again to these allusions uh, to the Old Testament. We've gone to those Old Testament passages to see what he's talking about. And we're going to do so again next Sunday, uh, two Sundays from now. The apostles, when they started preaching the gospel, they took it for granted that their Jewish listeners were familiar with the Old Testament. And what proof did they offer that Jesus had risen from the dead and that Jesus was the Messiah, they went back to all of those Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. The New Testament essentials includes the Christian doctrines of redemption and justification and reconciliation and sanctification and glorification and regeneration. You need to know those things. You should know a knowledge of Jesus' life story and teaching how the church got started and, and the, how the gospel spread and what the Holy Spirit is doing today in your life or trying to do. And you should know the Christian hope and you should know what to expect in the future. And you should know your relationship to the Old Testament Mosaic law as a Christian. Now, why should you know all that stuff? 
Why should you know all these things? Because, and here's the point, Christians who don't know the Bible can be led astray by strange teachings. And that is the subject of Hebrews this morning. We're in chapter 13, beginning in verse 8, which I believe should go with verse 9, but it appears in the previous paragraph. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Don't go to something new beyond the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet Christians who don't know their Christian theology can be led astray. It's not uncommon, and I've seen it many times over the years, uh, adults who are, have been in a Christian church, have been baptized, uh, converted either as teenagers or adults, have been in a church for years, suddenly go to a Mormon group, or they go to a Jehovah's Witness group, or they go to some other cult group. Groups that use Christian terminology but define them differently. They define justification differently. They define the cross differently. And Christians who, who, Christians who know what they believe aren't going to be led astray. They're going to recognize the falsehood of these things. It was true back then. We see it true in Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, reading from chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. He says, I am astonished. I can't get that out with my current voice problem like it should be. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a, a different gospel. Remember, there's another one of those words that wasn't on the quiz. Gospel means good news. A different good news, which is really no good news at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert or change or corrupt the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Ever since the first century, New ideas about the Christian faith, about what the Bible teaches. Uh, new theologies have come forth. <coughs> there are fads in theology that pop up every so often. The, one of them was, was going out when I got to seminary, a, a theology called liberation theology. It came out of South America. And it was, uh, it was big for a while, and it was kind of fading away when I got to seminary. These things are not new. They've been going on since the first century A.D. We have to be careful that we are not led astray by these things, and there are tons of them in our world today. You have to know your Bible. You have to know the doctrines of the Christian faith. If you don't, someone may lead you astray. Someone may lead you astray. We must each live daily in communion with Jesus, led by the Spirit, learning of our salvation. My wife and I met at seminary, one of our favorite stories. Uh, we both started in the same program, and in that program you had to have one semester of either Hebrew or Greek, and two semesters of the other one. So uh, we both had... Greek that first semester, but we had it by different professors. Uh, she had Dr. Omenson, and I don't remember my guy's name. <laughs> but the second semester, we both took second semester Greek, uh, and we were in the same class. And, and that's where we met, in second semester Greek, advanced Greek. Uh, we've always said that was the best thing about advanced Greek. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Omenson gave his first semester, first year students some wise advice. He said, you're going to hear lots of stuff in seminary. Uh, and some of it's going to sound really strange and some of it is strange. He said, 
Let me give you some advice. With one hand, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to your faith in Jesus. And with the other hand, let the Holy Spirit sift all of that stuff that's coming at you and let the Spirit tell you what's true and what to hold on to. That's what we have to do too. That's what we have to do too. But we need to be diligent students of the Bible and of our salvation in Jesus Christ and be on guard against strange teachings. And to be frank, that means you have to go beyond Sunday school and the sermons. You have to go beyond Sunday school and the sermons because in Sunday school and the sermons, we're not presenting Christian theology, this, those on this, this on this, on this, on this. Uh, systematic theology, which we had to take in seminary. We don't present the doctrines that way. There are ways to get that information. Uh, the Disciples Study Bible, uh, if you haven't seen one, I've got one in my, uh, in my study. The Disciples Study Bible lists all the Christian doctrines in the back. It gives you write-ups about them, shows you verses to read about them. It's a very good source for that. Uh, the Baptist Faith and Message, Southern Baptist, Baptist, Baptist Faith and Message, it explains key doctrines and gives you a whole long list of verses that you can look up to support those, it teaches you about those. Uh, recently, I found uh, free seminary courses. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to pay anything. They're free online from Dallas Seminary, a uh, very good school. Uh, you do have to sign up for them and such, but you can see the lectures for uh, for seminary courses online, and there are probably more, I'm sure. We need to do our best. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. 